Line Engine versus the Ants by Carl Stevenson. Unless they alter their course, and there's no reason why they should, they'll reach her plantation in two days at the latest. Line Engine sucked placidly at a cigar about the size of a corn cob and for a few seconds gazed without answering at the agitated district commissioner. Then he took the cigar from his lips and leaned slightly forward. With his bristling gray hair, bulky nose, and lucid eyes, he had the look of an aging and shabby eagle. Decent of you, he murmured, paddling all this way just to give me the tip. But you're pulling my leg, of course, when you say I must do a bunk. Why, even a herd of Saurians couldn't drive me from this plantation of mine. The Brazilian official threw up his lean and lanky arms and clawed the air with wildly distended fingers. Leiningen, he shouted, you're insane. They're not creatures you can fight, they're an elemental. An act of God. Ten miles long, two miles wide, ants, nothing but ants. And every single one of them a fiend from hell. Before you can spit three times, they'll eat a full-grown buffalo to the bones. I tell you, if, you're, if you don't clear out at once, there'll be nothing left of you but a skeleton picked as clean as your own plantation. Leiningen grinned. An act of God, my eye. Anyway, I'm not an old woman. I'm not going to run for it just because an elemental's on the way. And don't think I'm the kind of fathead who tries to fend off lightning with his fists, either. I'd use my intelligence, old man. With me, and the, with me, the brain isn't a second blind gut. I know what it's there for. When I began this model farm and plantation three, year, three years ago, I took into account all that could conceivably happen to it. And now I'm ready for anything and everything, including your aunts. The Brazilian rose heavily to his feet. I've done my best, he gasped. Your obstinacy endangers not only yourself, but the lives of your 400 workers. You don't know these ants. Leiningen accompanied him down to the river where the government launch was moored. The vessel cast off. As it moved downstream, the exclamation mark neared the rail and began waving its arms frantically. Long after the launch had disappeared round the bend, Leiningen thought he could still hear that dimming, imploring voice. You don't know them, I tell you. You don't know them. But the reported enemy was by no means unfamiliar to the planter. Before he started work on his settlement, he had lived long enough in the country to see for himself the fearful devastation sometimes wrought by these ravenous insects in their campaigns for food. But since then he had planned measures of defense accordingly, and these, he was convinced, were in every way adequate to withstand the approaching peril. Moreover, during his three years as a planter, Leiningen had met and defeated drought, hood, plague, and all other acts of God which had come against him unlike his fellow settlers in the district, who had made little or no resistance. This unbroken success he attributed solely to the observance of his lifelong motto, the human brain needs only to become fully aware of its powers to conquer even the elements. Dullards reeled senselessly and aimlessly into the abyss. Cranks, however, brilliant, lost their heads when circumstances suddenly altered or accelerated and ran into stone walls. Sluggards drifted with the current until they were caught in whirlpools and dragged under. But such disasters, Leiningen contended, merely strengthened his argument that intelligence, directed aright, invariably makes man the master of his fate. Yes, Leiningen had always known how to grapple with life. Even here in this Brazilian wilderness, his brain had triumphed over every difficulty and danger it had so far encountered. First he had vanquished primal forces by cunning and organization. Then he had enlisted the resources of modern science to increase miraculously the yield of his plantation. And now he was sure he would prove more than a match for the irresistible ants. That same evening, however, Leiningen assembled his workers. He had no intention of waiting until the news reached their ears from other sources. Most of them had been born in the district. The cry, the ants are coming, was to them an imperative signal for instant panic-stricken flight, a spring for life itself. But so great was the Indians' trust in Leiningen, in Leiningen's words, and in Leiningen's wisdom, that they received his curt tidings and his orders for the imminent struggle with the calmness with which they were given. They waited, unafraid, alert, as if for the beginning of a new game or hunt which he had just described to them. The ants were indeed mighty, but not so mighty as a boss. Let them come. 
They came at noon the second day. Their approach was announced by the wild unrest of the horses, scarcely controllable now, either in stall or under rider, scenting from afar a vapor instinct with horror. It was announced by a stampede of animals, timid and savage, hurtling past each other. Jaguars and pumas flashing by nimble stags of the pampas, bulky tapirs, no longer hunters, themselves hunted, outpacing fleet kinkajous. Maddened herds of cattle, heads lowered, nostrils snorting, rushing through tribes of loping monkeys, chattering in a dementia of terror. Then followed the creeping and spring indensians of bush and steppe, big and little rodents, snakes and lizards. Pell-mell the rabble swarmed down the hill to the plantation, scattered right and left before the barrier of, water fi of the water-filled ditch, then sped onwards to the river, where again hindered, they fled along its banks out of sight. The water-filled ditch was one of the defense measures which Leinigen had long since prepared against the advent of the ants. It encompassed three sides of the plantation like a huge horseshoe, twelve feet across but not very deep. When dry, it could hardly be described as an obstacle to either man or beast. But the ends of the horseshoe ran into the river which formed the northern boundary and fourth side of the plantation. And at the end, nearer the house and outbuildings in the middle of the plantation, Leinigen had constructed a dam by, which, by means of which water from the river could be diverted into the ditch. So now, by opening the dam, he was able to fling an impossible girdle of water, a huge quadrilateral, with the river as its base, completely around the plantation, like the moat encircling a medieval city. Unless the ants were clever enough to build rafts, they had hoped of reaching the plantation, Leinigen concluded. The twelve-foot water ditch seemed to afford in itself all the security needed, but while awaiting the arrival of the ants, Leinigen made a further improvement. The western section of the ditch ran along the edge of a tamarind wood, and the branches of some great trees reached over the water. Leningen now had them lopped so that ants could not descend from within the moat. The women and children, then the herds of cattle, were escorted by peons on rafts over the river, to remain on the other side in absolute safety until the plunderers had departed. Leningen gave this instruction not because he believed the non-combatants were in any danger, but in order to avoid hampering the efficiency of the defenders. Critical situations first become crises, he explained to his men, when oxen or women get excited. Finally, he made a careful inspection of the inner moat, a smaller ditch lined with concrete, which extended around the hill on which stood the ranch house, barns, stables, and other buildings. Into this concrete ditch emptied an inflow pipes from three great petrol tanks. If by some miracle the ants managed to cross the water and reach the plantation, this rampart of petrol would be an absolutely impassable protection for the besieged and their dwellings and stock. Such, at least, was Linen Jin's opinion. He stationed his men at irregular distances along the water ditch, the first line of defense. Then he lay down in his hammock and puffed drowsily away at his pipe until a peon came with the report that the ants had been observed far away in the south. Leinigen mounted his horse, which at the feel of its master seemed to forget its uneasiness, and rode leisurely in the direction of the threatening offensive. The th southern stretch of the ditch, the upper side of the quadrilateral, was nearly three miles long. From its center, one could survey the entire countryside. This was destined to be the scene of the outbreak of war between Leinigen's brain and the twenty square miles of life-destroying ants. It was a sight one could never forget. Over the range of hills as far as eye could see crept a darkening hem, ever longer and broader until the shadow spread across the slope from east to west, then downwards, downwards, uncannily swift, and all the green herbage of that wide vista was being mown as by a giant sickle, leaving only the vast moving shadow, extending, deepening, and moving rapidly nearer. When Leinigen's men, behind their barrier of water, perceived the approach of the long-expected foe, they gave vent to their suspense in screams and imprecations. 
But as the distance be began to lessen between the sons of hell and the water ditch, they relapsed into silence. Before the advance of that awe-inspiring throng, their belief in the powers of the boss began to steadily dwindle. Even Leinigen himself, who had ridden up just in time to restore their loss of heart by a display of unshakable calm, even he could not free himself from a qualm of malaise. Yonder were thousands of millions of voracious jaws bearing down upon him, and only a suddenly insignificant narrow ditch lay between him and his men and being gnawed to the bones before you can spit three times. Hadn't his brain for once taken on more than it could manage? If the blighters decided to rush the ditch, fill it to the brim with their corpses, there'd still be more than enough to destroy every trace of that cranium of his. The planter's chin jutted. They hadn't got him yet, and he'd see to it they never would. While he could think at all, he'd flout both death and the devil. The hostile army was approaching in perfect formation. No human battalions, however well drilled, could ever hope to rival the precision of that advance. Along a front that moved forward as uniformly as a straight line, the ants drew nearer and nearer to the water ditch. Then, when they learned through their scouts the nature of the obstacle, the two outlying wings of the army detached themselves from the main body and marched down the western and eastern sides of the ditch. This surrounding maneuver took rather more than an hour to accomplish. No doubt the ants expected that at some point they would find a crossing. During this outflanking movement by the wings, the army on the center and southern front remained still. The besieged were therefore able to contemplate at their leisure the thumb-long, reddish-black, long-legged insects. Some of the Indians believed they could see, too, intent on them, the brilliant cold eyes and the razor-edged mandibles of this host of infinity. It is not easy for the average person to imagine that an animal, not to mention an insect, can think. But now both the European brain of Linogen and the primitive brains of the Indians began to stir with the unpleasant foreboding that inside every single one of that deluge of insects dwelt a thought. And that thought was, ditch or no ditch, we'll get to your flesh. Not until four o'clock did the wings reach the horseshoe ends of the ditch, only to find these ran into the great river. Through some kind of secret telegraphy, the report must then have flashed very swiftly indeed along the entire enemy line. And Linogen riding, no longer casually, along his side of the ditch, noticed by energetic and widespread movements of troops that for some unknown reason the news of the check had its greatest effect on the southern front, where the main army was massed. Perhaps the failure to find a way over the ditch was persuading the ants to withdraw from the plantation in search of spoils more easily attainable. An immense flood of ants, about a hundred yards in width, was pouring in a glimmering black cataract down the far slope of the ditch. Many thousands were already drowning in the sluggish, creeping flow, but they were followed by troop after troop who clamored over their sinking comrades and then themselves served as dying bridges to the reserves hurrying on in their rear. Shoals of ants were being carried away by the current into the middle of the ditch, where gradually they broke asunder and then, exhausted by their struggles, vanished below their surface. Nevertheless, the wavering, floundering, hundred-yard front was remorselessly if slowly advancing towards the besieged on the other bank. Linogen had been wrong when he supposed the enemy would first have to fill the ditch with their bodies before they could cross. Instead, they merely needed to act as stepping stones as they swam and sank to the hordes of hordes ever pressing onwards from behind. Near Linogen, a few mounted herdsmen awaited his orders. He sent one to the weir. The river must be dammed more strongly to increase the speed and power of the water coursing through the ditch. A second PN was dispatched to the outhouses to bring spades and petrol sprinklers. A third rode away to summon to the zone of the offensive all the men except the observation posts on the nearby sections of the ditch which were not yet actively threatened. The ants were getting across far more quickly than Linogen would have deemed possible. Impelled by the mighty cascade behind them, they struggled nearer and nearer to the inner bank. 
The momentum of the attack was so great that neither the tardy flow of the stream nor its downward pull could exert its proper force, and into the the gap left by every submerging insect hastened forward a dozen more. When reinforcements reached Linogen, the invaders were halfway over. The planter had to admit to himself that it was only by a stroke of luck for him that the ants were attempting the crossing on a relatively short front. Had they assaulted simultaneously along the entire length of the, of the ditch, the outlook for the defenders would have been black indeed. Even as it was, it could hardly be described as rosy, though the planter seemed quite unaware that death in a gruesome form was drawing closer and closer. As the war between his brain and the act of God reached its climax, the very shadow of annihilation began to pale to Leiningen, who now felt like a champion in a new Olympic game, a gigantic and thrilling contest from which he was determined to emerge victor. Such, indeed, was his aura of confidence that the Indians forgot their stupefied fear of the peril only a yard or two away. Under the planter's supervision, they began fervidly digging up to the edge of the bank and throwing clods of earth and spadefuls of sand into the midst of the hostile fleet. <laughs>